Only two weeks left in the college football regular season, and we are going to pick every ranked game against the spread. I'm Chris Hassel, soon to be joined by Brady Quinn and Sportsline's Emery Hunt. The big one this week is in the Big Ten, Ohio State and Michigan State. Top ten game, probably a playoff elimination game. Meantime on CBS, Alabama with a chance to clinch the SEC West. The SEC Game of the Week is back at Bama for a top 25 matchup between the Crimson Tide and the Razorbacks. For Alabama, the stakes are clear. Win Saturday and they punch their ticket to the SEC Championship game against the top-ranked Georgia Bulldogs. And while Alabama continues to ride the hot hand of Heisman Trophy contender Bryce Young, Nick Saban trying to keep the focus on the present. It's our last game in Bryant-Denny Stadium. That's been a great atmosphere to play in, and it's certainly needed to be that way for this game. And Obama is a 20-point favorite. Arkansas is on the rise under head coach Sam Pittman, and they have a head-to-head -head win against Texas A&M, the only team to beat Alabama this season. A win Saturday would not only shake up the playoff race, it would put the Hogs in position for a New Year's Six Bowl. I was really proud of our guys being down at half, coming back. It wasn't pretty, but when that ball went through the uprights, it was one of the prettiest things I'd ever seen. But it has been a long time since Arkansas beat Alabama. Pre-Nick Saban times back in 2006 when Mike Shula was the head coach in Tuscaloosa. It's the SEC Game of the Week between Arkansas and Alabama, Saturday, 3.30 Eastern on CBS. All right, I'm Chris Hassel, joined by Brady Quinn and Emery Hunt. Uh, Emery, Brady was a Heisman finalist the last time Arkansas beat Alabama. It was that long ago, young man. 15 years ago? Yeah. <laughs> wow. 2006. Lots changed. Lots, lo lots changed for Alabama, yeah. I guess, and Arkansas uh, at this point. But here's the deal for this game. This game, it's not about whether or not Alabama will win. Alabama's going to win this game. It's just whether or not if they're able to cover the spread in this case – and I think they're going to, in part because Alabama's that team right now that's in a position to potentially go to the playoff, even with a loss in the SEC championship game, which with a win in this matchup, they will clinch the SEC West and they will be meeting Georgia. So to me, they've got to keep that number two spot in order to do so. They need to look impressive, both versus Arkansas this week and obviously in the Iron Bowl versus Auburn next week. But look, the reality of this is Sam Pittman, the head coach for Arkansas, he wants this to be a street fight. He wants Arkansas to be able to control the line of scrimmage, run the football, and beat down Alabama a little bit because they have lo looked susceptible from time to time. The difference is Alabama's going to be well-rested. They're coming off a beat down of New Mexico State last week, and so they're not going to feel the effects of what has been a long SEC season for Alabama. And Bryce Young will lead them to not only cover this spread, but win convincingly. So, Emery, I don't know how you feel about this one, but I've got the Crimson Tide. Yeah, I'm rolling right there with you, Brady, for a lot of the reasons that you talked about. More in particular, they have to win in an impressive fashion because right now, if you're watching Alabama play, take out that New Mexico State game, are they really the top one of the top four teams in the country based off how they've looked? Uh, so this is a game I feel bad for Arkansas because they're catching Alabama at the worst possible time. It's style points time for Alabama, and they have to go out there and dominate on both sides, and I think they will. I do like Arkansas to play well in, in the first quarter, but then Alabama will realize they have to start you know, wooing some of these voters and really start to put their claim on one of those playoff spots. They can't take a loss, and I think they also have to win in an impressive fashion as well. You know, the kryptonite for Alabama this season has been really pressuring Bryce Young, that offensive line play, but that's just not what Arkansas does. Well, they're 13th as far as sacks uh, in the SEC this year. So even if they were going to try to be able to pull off the upset, that kryptonite for Alabama, it's not present there with Arkansas's defense. Quickly, Brady, why do you think Alabama still has a chance to make the playoff even if they lose an SEC championship game to Georgia? Yeah, to me, I think in part they've got two of the best players in the country, you know, in Bryce Young and Will Anderson Jr. And I think with a close loss to Georgia, we've already seen the committee go ahead and put them up there at number two, even with a loss. They've done that for a while now ahead of teams that at certain points throughout the college football playoff rankings were unbeaten. So clearly they trust Nick Saban, and that's what this is really about. They understand that if Alabama, who is one of the more talented teams based on recruiting and has been battle-tested and has – but potentially, you know, the Heisman Trophy winner in Bryce Young, they trust them to go into the playoff and be able to potentially win a game, if not win both, and win the national championship because they've seen it do it before. And here's the other thing is no one wants to talk about it. 
it's ratings. Alabama is going to rate. They're one of the bigger brands too. If you put Cincinnati in, you tell me, who's going to tune in to watch as much as see Cincinnati versus Alabama? You might get some people who are curious, but the reality is that's not as attractive of a matchup as having Alabama as a part of the playoff. And if they do get in, they probably would just drop them to three so right. that they wouldn't, they wouldn't have a rematch, have a rematch. In, that, yeah. in that semifinal game. All right, uh, that game's 3.30 Eastern on CBS. Let's move to another top 25 matchup. And this is number three Oregon as an underdog, Emery, at Utah. The Ducks are getting three in this one. Yeah, I'm not understanding this one at all because I like Oregon to win in this ball game straight up. And so take Oregon in the points. Big fan of Anthony Brown and what he does at the quarterback position. I think he's a stable guy, kind of helps balance out that offense. But I feel like defensively, they're hitting their stride on that side of the football. They're playing well on the back seven part of their defense. But I just see this as a matchup where Oregon is one of the better team, has a better quarterback, and is playing their best football at this moment. Oregon clinches the Pac-12 North with a win. Uh, I think the other thing that's significant about it is really it's their last ranked opponent they're probably going to face the rest of the way. I don't imagine Oregon State's going to be ranked uh, two weeks from now. And then if they beat Utah, well, Utah's probably going to fall back out of the top 25. So it's an important game for many reasons for Oregon. But I'm with Emory. I don't really understand what the point is of the spread at this point. I know it's on the road. It's in Salt Lake. That is at altitude. And Utah can be a tough out. Look, Cameron Rising has brought a different element to this passing offense for Utah. But to me, it's been Travis Dye, the, the player you're looking at right there. In for C.J. Verdell. He's really carried the load running the football along with Anthony Brown at the quarterback spot. Uh, but also that defense, as, as Emory touched on, it's coming around. For me, Oregon up front, Kayvon Thibodeau, that's going to be an issue. Two sacks last week versus Washington State. If this becomes a shootout, and that's exactly what Utah doesn't want to be, Thibodeau is going to have a big game pressuring Cameron Rising. And on the flip side, Utah is usually known for being the best rush defense in the Pac-12. Not the case this year. So it really plays into the hand of Mario Cristobal and Oregon and what they want to do, running the football, controlling the game from that standpoint. So I'll gladly take the three points if you're going to give them to me. I think Oregon wins, so you might as well go ahead and bet the money line as well. I think we'll see a rematch of that in the Pac-12 championship game as well. Yes, I think you're going to see Oregon and Utah squaring off once again. So Oregon might have to beat them twice. We'll have to beat them twice more than likely if they're going to get into the playoff. If they lose this game or, or, or one game down the stretch, really opens up a lot of possibilities in the playoff for teams like a Cincinnati we need a little bit of help. Let's move on to, to the biggest game of the weekend. It's in the Big Ten, Michigan State, Ohio State. Brady, this is a huge number. I know it's at Ohio State. I know it's at Columbus. But, man, the, the, the public loves the Buckeyes at minus 19 here. Well, it's a big number for the reason. This is just a gigantic mismatch between what Ohio State does well, which is arguably one of the most prolific passing attacks in the country, led by the quarterback C.J. Stroud, but really uh, just an embarrassment of riches at wide receiver. Now, whether you want to go with Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave, Jackson Smith in Jigba, uh, Ruckert at the tight end spot, and Trevion Henderson not only running the football, but also as an option, especially in the screen game, it's an embarrassment of riches going up against a Michigan State defense that is the worst in the Big Ten this year. So I think Ohio State gets off to a fast start at home. I think they force Michigan State out of what they want to do, which is handing the football off to Kenneth Walker. And this game then gets put on the shoulders of Peyton Thorne. And that's not to say that Reed and Naylor on the outside can't make some plays versus this Ohio State secondary, but it's going to be an uphill battle all game long in Columbus. It's a big number. I'm laying the points. Though. I think Michigan State's in for a rough road ahead the next couple of weeks. And remember, Ohio State can clinch the Big Ten East with a win, and then it would be an upset from Maryland beating Michigan. Right. Otherwise, they'll be able to control their own destiny. They have to win the next two weeks, and they're playing in the Big Ten championship game. Emery? Yeah, I'm going what we used to call this buck ball in college where you just, all right, we're not going to throw the football at all. We're just going to get six tight ends out there to try to drain this clock. That's the best defense in this game for Michigan State. Can they run the football? They're going to have to, and I think that – is where they can have some success against this Ohio State defense. You go back to two teams that really ran the football against them. It was early in the season, and they had some issues with that. And they haven't really faced a team that is going to be dedicated to the run game like Michigan State will be in this ball game. This is a big number like you talked about, Chris. But I think Kenneth Walker is going to be their best defender in this ball game because they're going to lean up on that, run, on that uh, offensive line and try to drain this ball, drain this clock, take the air out of the football and really not put their defense out there often because it won't take much, like Brady talked about, for Ohio State to score with that receiving core. So the best thing they can do, run the football, drain the clock, and try to get out there under 19.5 points, and I think they will.
Kind of a risky strategy, but if you're Michigan State, right, you're the away team. You win the coin toss, you take that football. You do not defer to halftime. You take that football, you take all the air out of that stadium there in Columbus, and you go ahead and run down the field, 10, 12 play drive, and literally try to jump ahead and play that style of football game. Now, that can backfire on you because this Ohio State defense is much improved defensively stopping the run. Since that Oregon loss, they've only given up over 100 yards twice and three total rushing touchdowns since that game. So risky strategy, but I think that's the only way Michigan State can win this thing. If they are able to pull it out, it changes everything in the Big Ten and in the playoff race. Michigan State would be in the driver's seat in that division and in the Big Ten to potentially get that playoff spot. Let's recap the first three picks from Brady and Emery. They agree on Alabama covering that big number against Arkansas. They agree on Oregon, and uh, I believe Emery said as well, he thinks Oregon's going to win this game outright. So put some uh, sprinklage down on the plus 140 money line for the Ducks. And some disagreement there for Michigan State and Ohio State in the top 10 matchup in the Big Ten. Well, Michigan just won at Penn State. Next week they have Ohio State. Could be a trap game against Maryland. See what side the fellas fall on next. All right, picking college football games against the spread, all the ranked teams anyway. The ranked teams not playing FCS opponents. We have a couple of those, including Georgia playing an FCS opponent. Oh, no, that, there's not a spread on that no one? No legal line. spreads. There's okay. some offshore lines, but nothing legal. I mean, Alabama covered, what was the 51 and a half last week? That was an FBS team, though, I believe, right? True, true. But we can still get, that, we can still get those lines up there. Uh, Jack says no. That's our producer. All right. What he says goes. That's Brady Quinn, Emery Hunt from Sportsline. Let's, uh, let's go to Michigan and Maryland in the Big Ten. Trap game? Uh, potentially for Michigan, the problem is, is they can't afford to look ahead to Ohio State because they've got to take care of business. They, they have to win out, and they obviously need a little bit of help, too. They need Michigan State to lose either to Ohio State or Penn State for then Michigan to have a shot at winning the Big Ten East and playing for a Big Ten championship. Look, this, this game, too, is just a bad matchup for Maryland. If you look at what Maryland wants to do, uh, Talia Tongovailoa wants to sling the football around. Rakeem Jarrett's one of the better wide receivers in the Big Ten. But you're going up against the Michigan defense that's one of the best in the Big Ten and two of the best edge rushers in all of college football in Aiden Hutchinson and David Ajabo. So that's one end of the conversation. The other end is the ability for Michigan to control the game, running the football with Hassan Haskins. And when they need to, Cade McNamara has been clutch. And you can pick Cornelius Johnson, Eric All, whoever you want to talk about. This team has primed itself and has put itself in a position now to finally compete with the Ohio State Buckeyes. But this is first, to me, a tune-up match. So lay the points with Michigan. Don't think anything about it. I know it looks like a big line for Big Ten football late in the year. But Emory, I don't think Michigan's going to have any trouble whatsoever with Maryland. Hey, man, listen, man. They, what the saying is Maryland is known for crab cakes in football. It is not crab cakes in defense because Maryland definitely can't play defense. And I see Michigan just running up and down the field on a terrapins. And you're right. They want to play fast. They want to get to the line of scrimmage and run the next play. But to me, again, that just sounds like a lot of fast three and out. So this could get ugly early uh, for Maryland. So lay those points with Michigan to have full confidence. Just move on to the next game. It was a 4-0 start for Maryland. But since then, they've lost five of six. And all five losses have been by three or more possessions. Uh, another Big Ten ranked team in action. Wisconsin is humming right now. They've won six straight. They're two wins away from a Big Ten championship game. Nebraska, though, might be the best seven-loss team in the country. Yeah, no, I mean, look, and it's because of their front seven. The way they play, in particular on defense, I mean, they've figured some things out. And they're going to have to play great defense in this one because they fired almost their entire offensive yeah. staff. And, and it, it seems like Nebraska is looking towards next year. Now, they had a bye last week. They should be well-rested. They should be able to figure some things out as far as how they want to go about trying to attack this, this Wisconsin defense. I would say the best play here is probably the under. It will be a defensive battle between these two teams. But the reality is Wisconsin, if they win out, is on a path to the Big Ten championship after such a tough start to the season. And it's been largely their defense that's held them there and given this opportunity. But the offense has come along. Braylon Allen, the freshman running back, uh, he's really kind of mixed into the full and done a great job now carrying the load with the injury to Ches Malusi. Then Graham Mertz, he hasn't necessarily wowed you, but he has continued to improve, and they are spreading the football around to their wide receiver group, Danny Davis, Kendrick Pryor, Pryor and the like. So I like Wisconsin here. I think they take care of business. Uh, I just think Nebraska is looking forward to 2022 with all the changes they made, Emery. Yeah, and Adrian Martinez and company, they love to, to muck the game up and, and make it ugly. 
But you're right. Wisconsin's offense is playing so much better than what we saw from them earlier in the season. And that, to me, is the reason why they'll cover this spread. It'll be low scoring. I'm with you on that. But I just think that, uh, you know, Nebraska won't have the opportunity to mess it up because how, of how efficient and effective Wisconsin has been on offense the last four or five weeks. If Wisconsin does cover the nine and a half, it'll be the first time all season Nebraska loses by double figures. All seven losses by single digits for the Cornhuskers sitting at three and seven. They can't get out of their own way. No, uh, just can't win games down the stretch. They don't know how to do it under Scott Frost, but they're going to give them at least one more year there in Lincoln. The Iowa Hawkeyes need a Wisconsin loss in the last two games to get to the Big Ten championship game. They're home against Illinois. No Brett Bielema in this one. He's out with COVID. No, and, and they should be able to take care of business versus Illinois. They're essentially a one-dimensional football team. They want to run the football. They can't throw the football effectively, and they won't be able to on the road versus one of the better defenses in Iowa, um, in particular with the way those guys have played up front, and in particular on the back end being ball hawks all season long. The story with Iowa, though, is the changeup at quarterback. Alex Padilla, the, the ability he's given them, more of the downfield passing game, Hasn't been necessarily overly efficient, but a couple touchdown passes last week and the way they've continued to hang their hat on Tyler Goodson in the rushing attack. So this is one where, again, big line, big spread. I'm going to lay those points with Iowa here, but another bet with the way both teams like to run the football, the under, I think, is, is a safe play here as well, Emery. The broadcaster's dream, man. Both teams run the football. You can get out of there quickly and get back <laughs> home <laughs> right away, man. But I'm with you guys. Brett Bielema not being I think that's huge, you know, as far as, you know, motivation, adjustments, things of that nature. So without him there, uh, I'm laying those points with Io with ease. Plus, just an ineffective Illinois offense. I just don't think uh, they match up well versus Iowa. I just like the Hawkeyes to roll in this one straight this up. Is the fourth straight Iowa game where the total is under 40 points. They play great defense. They do. Not and, great offense. And well, they, they like to be a little more conservative with how they go about risking that football out. I think they got up to 27 last week, though. 27-22, yeah. they beat Minnesota. People were going wild. Oh, ah, yeah. Was hoisting up the pig. We got uh, Floyd Rosedale Floyd. again. Let's go to the American Conference, and it all starts with Cincinnati, number five. I mean, they haven't played well in a month. If they play in this game against SMU like they have the last four games. Who's beat? That's what I, yeah. I mean, I, the, the, they'll get beat with the beat passing double attack. Digits. Yeah, they'll get, they'll get beat with that passing attack of, of SMU. And look, Houston's already clinched their spot to the AAC championship game. Cincinnati needs this win to do so. But I think the other thing Cincinnati needs to do is SMU is still viewed as a good football team. They've been ranked at times this season. The biggest thing for me is the fact that the committee has not docked Cincinnati. Regardless of what you want to believe with the AP poll, they have not docked Cincinnati for a lot of these close wins or close, maybe debatable performances, if you will, over the course of the last month. So this is your opportunity, Cincinnati. It's out here for you. You're going to have the chance to potentially Jump up in the top four if you can win and if you can win convincingly. So Desmond Ritter, who started to get back on track, the rushing attack was missing Jerome four, but they're still able to kind of carry the load there. It's really about how Tanner Mordecai handles the pressure and the ability for guys like Ahmad Gardner in the secondary for Cincinnati to match up with them on the outside. So Emory, we may differ in this one. I think Cincinnati has to cover in this case to keep giving themselves a chance because they haven't really played great football the past month. And in order to convince the committee, they're going to have to lay a big number. So if they get up, I don't think they're taking their foot off the gas pedal on this one. Well, that's the thing they have to cover, but I don't think they can because we just saw them allow South Florida to get down the field in, in a couple of plays and score. And this is a much more dangerous offense. I just love what they do out there offensively. They're going to challenge your linebackers, whether or not they can cover. Uh, they got Cal Gutierrez at tight end. Bentley, the running back, is one carry away from always a house call. I think this will be a, a very tough game. This will warrant uh, Cincinnati playing a close game, uh, a tighter score than the other matchups. So I think because of that, because of what SMU brings to the table, they got some dogs too. So I see this one very close and one that Cincinnati's defense will have to win in the end. It'll definitely be under that, that point spread. Okay, opposite sides of that one. Brady likes Cincinnati to cover the 11 and a half. Emory does not. I think if you're a Cincinnati fan, you're rooting for Houston in the against Memphis. Maybe make that conference championship game uh, a, a better, uh, more marquee matchup for you against a ranked team. But you Houston, Houston with just one loss all season. I mean, they're rolling right now. They're rolling right now. Clayton Toon's playing fantastic football at the quarterback spot. He hasn't thrown an interception in six games. So really good on a good job taking care of the football. And Houston's got one of the better defenses too in the AAC. So Kind of something to keep an eye on here, but I do wonder if Dana Holgerson is going to hold something back. 
He knows it. I mean, the next couple of weeks, they know they're already in the championship game. Do they hold something back, you know, offensively, defensively, not mix in quite as many wrinkles? So that's kind of part of this. But look, it's not like Memphis can't score points either. Seth, Seth Hennigan's done a good job. Don't air that puppy out there, Memphis. So I think the best play here is the over of 60 and a half. Now, what I think is going to end up happening is a backdoor cover by Memphis, but I like the over better. So I'm going to take the eight and a half points. But to me, Emory, the over is the play. Yeah, I wish you, I'm with you with the over. We agree there. But I like Houston here because of the big reason you brought up their defense, man. Probably one of the better open field tackling teams in the American Athletic Conference. And, and that's what Memphis wants to challenge you to do. Consistently make plays in space. Try to tackle these fast guys on the perimeter. Houston can do that and they can apply pressure. This is one of the better run defenses as well. I think their defense will be the key here. But yeah, that school board is going to get a lot of work on Saturday. It's going over. And uh, I, I have written down here it's a Friday game. Yes, I think it's Friday, Friday, 9 o'clock Eastern time. So don't let that one sneak up on you if you want to bet it. Uh, Houston and Memphis, Friday night in a big matchup in the American Conference. Recapping the picks in the Big Ten and the American from Brady and Emery. Both like the Wolverines, both like the Badgers and the Hawkeyes. The Overs as well in those two American Conference matchups. Over 65 SMU Cincinnati, over 60 and a half in Memphis and Houston. Up next, Notre Dame still plugging along with that one loss. In the eighth spot, maybe chaos ensues, and they can be a playoff contender. They've got Georgia Tech this week. All right, let's pick uh, ACC ranked games, and uh, we'll throw Notre Dame in there. Kind of an honorary ACC team. They are playing an ACC opponent in Georgia Tech. Wake Forest, top 10, big game at Clemson. And the Tigers are favorites in that one. As bad as Clemson's been, they're still 7-3. and three, Not too bad. Kenny Pickett in Pittsburgh taking on Virginia. Big game in the division over there in the Coastal. And NC State taking on Syracuse, the Will Brinson Fest. Let's start with Notre Dame. Still just that one loss to Cincinnati this season. 17-point uh, favorites here. Yeah, big-time favorites here. And they need big-time style points if they have any chance whatsoever of getting the college football playoff. It just seems like it's going to be really difficult given that if Cincinnati stays undefeated and they don't get in, how could you possibly put Notre Dame in? But in this matchup, I think the biggest thing for Notre Dame is being able to stop a running back like Jameer Gibbs who's going to impact the game in every single way possible, running the football, catching the football in the return game too. Uh, we don't know right now if it's going to be Jeff Sims or Jordan Yates at the quarterback spot. Either way, though, you know their ability to run the football at the quarterback position is what could give Notre Dame some issues. That being said, Notre Dame's going to cover the 17-point spread. Um, they're playing their best football right now. A lot of young players have stepped up, in particular in the backfield. Uh, uh, Logan uh, Diggs has stepped up in a big way. But Kyron Williams has been one of the more underrated players in all of college football. I mean, he is an absolute joy and pleasure to watch. doesn't matter if he's catching the football, running the football, even in you know, pass protection, he does a heck of a job. And defensively, you know, this defense has gotten more and more comfortable as the season's gone along. They're not going to have their best player, Kyle Hamilton, but again, that secondary has adjusted at this point. So, love Notre Dame here laying the 17 points. I think a lower scoring game, too. I like the under. Yeah, I'm laying the points here as well, man. I look at this matchup and just say Notre Dame is so much better than Georgia Tech at the point of attack on both sides of the ball. And Georgia Tech, they have some talented skill players, but man, up front, they still have some issues. And you don't want to have issues up front on either side of the line of scrimmage when you're facing Notre Dame because that's where they thrive. That's the area that they live in. I think Notre Dame will just run their way to victory here uh, easily. So lay those 17 points. Okay, Notre Dame minus the 17 is the pick. Let's move on to number 10, Wake Forest at unranked Clemson. Clemson not going to have Justin Ross. Who would have thought that, know, by the crazy, way, huh? at the beginning of the season? Like, like these, you know, the rankings would be this way. But... I think a lot of people would think, geez, if Clemson was 10th at this point in the season, that would be a disappointment. Right now, they're yeah. not even ranked. No, it's incredible. It really is to think about the run that Wake's had this year. And with a win, too, they can clinch the Atlantic Division. So either a win versus Clemson or versus BC next week. But the big storyline for this game is you have the number one scoring offense in Wake taking on the number one scoring defense in Clemson. And if you really look at, since Dave Clawson has taken over as head coach at Wake, they have had a hard time getting anything going versus this Clemson defense. It's Brent Venables, the blitz package, the front, the personnel, the ability to cover. Wake's averaging, and this is dating back to 2014, 11 points per game versus Clemson. 
I mean, they just they have not been able to figure it out. And to me, it's in part because of this slow RPO style of offense that they utilize. You hate that offense. I hate it because when you when you charge that mesh point, <laughs> or you have the ability to have front players who then penetrate and create havoc in the backfield. That all goes out the window. I mean, your quarterback now isn't so much worried about the player he's reading in the RPO. He's more concerned with just ball security and whether or not he's going to get hit. And that's pretty much been how Clemson's been able to play this. And, you know, they can lock down the wide receivers, whether it's Perry or Roberson on the outside with the talented secondary that they have. So, look, I know this isn't the same Clemson team we're accustomed to seeing. Clemson's going to win this game, and they're going to cover that spread with the four points. So I'm on that side here. I just think until we see Wake get over that mountaintop, it's hard for me to buy into it right now, Emery. Yeah, as a running back, I, I hate that slow mesh because I'm taking that ball every time because you can't <laughs> let me just get up there and get smacked, get all these hits, and then all of a sudden you pull the ball out. Like, now we both going down or I'm going down by myself. But I, I like Wake Forest here, man. I'm taking Wake Forest in the points. Maybe a three-point game more so than four. I look for a lot of trickeration here coming from Wake Forest because they have to get over this hump. Like Brady talked about, this is the one team that really can shut down uh, what they do offensively. So I feel like this will be the game where we will see a different Wake Forest offense in terms of a lot more wrinkles thrown in uh, to try to knock out Clemson and get on over to that ACC title game. But I, I just feel like this is the game where we'll see uh, Wake maybe sort of back off a little bit from that slow walkthrough mesh point that everybody in college football hates. Uh, that's the big one in the Atlantic. There's also a huge one in the Coastal. Virginia is at Pittsburgh. Winner of this game is going to have the inside track to the conference championship game. Yeah, and that's really the biggest key here. And that and then whether or not Brennan Armstrong, quarterback for UVA, plays. Didn't play last week versus Notre Dame, and I mean, they just look like a completely different team. I mean, they were very inept um, offensively. You can credit Notre Dame's defense, but Brennan Armstrong adds a completely different dimension to this team. So, you know, for me, it, it really weighs heavily on that. Not knowing right now, I'm going to go ahead and lay the 14 and a half points. Hate the hook here, uh, but I think that is the fair thing to do and play. And it's in part because of Kenny Pickett. Uh, he's been phenomenal all year long. Over 340 yards last week, three touchdowns in their overtime win versus UNC. Every single time this dude comes out and he steps up to play. And I understand at times he's going to see some different looks, different blitz packages from Bronco Mendenhall. But I'm willing to lay the 14 and a half points. And I think you, you, you lay them and you make that bet right now until we figure out whether or not Brennan Armstrong has any play in this game for me, Emery. Yeah, I'm laying those points. I trust Pitt's offense. And we got to give credit to Brennan Marion and the job he's done with those wide receivers, man. They do a fantastic job of, one, getting open, but also staying open and helping their quarterback out. Kenny Pick is able to break contain and get outside and find guys deep down the field because these receivers are not just out there watching the play happen like most you know guys do. They're trying to find open spots, and, and Kenny Pickett has done a fantastic job in hitting those guys. So I got to give a shout-out to Brendan Marion. And this entire offense just does a great job of putting the ball in the paint. I think they can win easily here against uh, Virginia Toledo's points. So that even though it's a big spread, lay them anyway. Both land the points with Pittsburgh minus 14.5. One more ranked team in action in the ACC. It's NC State giving 11 at home to Syracuse, but I, I don't know how you take Syracuse after what we saw last week against Louisville. It was unbelievable. I mean, what we call this this Lamar, Lamar Jackson effect just because he's, these are tying his yeah, numbers, right. so Syracuse just decides not to show up. 41-3. I mean, to 41-3. to three. I don't know what you throw into that. And really, when you think about Syracuse this season, you know, Sean Tucker, uh, Gary Schrader, they've done a good job like kind of running the football. Um, you know, Tucker's one of the better running backs in the country. So it's it just there's really no explanation for it. I think the tough thing for Syracuse, too, is you are getting a ticked-off NC State team that you know, went blow for blow with Wake, didn't end up winning it in the end. But look what Dave Dorn has built this program into. They're one of the better defensive teams in the ACC. Um, you've got their, their quarterback, Devin Leary, is able to sling it all around the park. So they're going to be able to put up a bunch of points here. This is another one where, again, big spread, double digits, but lay the 11 points with NC State. I think they feel like they can still salvage some, th some things from what has been a, a good season and next year really look to continue to keep building off that and make it great. Yeah, I, I love Bo Knight, the running back, and Ameki, you know, out there at wide receiver. Uh, the fact of the matter is their defense is outstanding. The fact that Louisville held Syracuse's offense to three points and Louisville's defense shows up when they want to. This is a defense in North Carolina State that shows up every week. I don't see this being something different for Syracuse. I see it almost as a repeat performance that we saw last week against the Cardinals. So I'm laying those points comfortably uh, with the Wolfpack.
Okay, agreement on NC State minus the 11 at home against Syracuse. Also agreement from the guys on Notre Dame minus 17 at home against Georgia Tech. Uh, they differ on Wake Forest and Clemson, but agreement on Pitt as well. Pitt minus 14 and a half against Virginia. Up next, we're moving to the Big 12. Oklahoma coming off that loss to Baylor, hosting an Iowa State team in the midst of a really disappointing season. All right, look at the Big 12 here. There's three teams in the top 13 fighting for that championship. Oklahoma's at home against Iowa State. Baylor is at Kansas State in a pick'em. Oklahoma State is at Texas Tech. It's a round robin in the regular season. The top two teams play each other in the Big, Ten, uh, Big 12 championship game. Brady Quinn and Emery Hunt here to pick the games against the spread. Let's start with Oklahoma State, now the highest ranked Big 12 team on the road at Texas Tech. Feeling good. They just beat Iowa State. They need one win to get a spot in the Big 12 championship game. If I'm Oklahoma State, I get it this week versus Texas Better. Tech because it may be tough to come by versus Oklahoma and Bedlam the last week. But the reality is, is this Oklahoma State, Oklahoma State team is playing some of the best football in the Big 12. The rushing attack with Jalen Warren, Sanders adds to that as well, but really their defense. Their defense is suffocating. It's the best in the Big 12. It's the best on third down. The variations of looks and pressures that they get, uh, it's it just it's, it's tough to go up against. I think that's really where Texas Tech struggles here, which, look, knocking off Iowa State last week and any chance they had of playing in the Big 12 championship game, that was probably felt more like their Super Bowl. I think this team is more looking towards 2022 at this point. Meanwhile, Oklahoma State still has everything out there in front of them. So look for them to do everything they can to make sure they win this game cover that spread because I still think they've got a shot at playing in the college football playoff. Now, we've never seen a team ranked past seven at this point in time in the college football playoff committee rankings and make it within the top four, but I still think with a win versus Tech and then Oklahoma next week and then potentially winning again against Oklahoma the following week, I would assume Oklahoma would still be ranked. It'd be a pretty darn good case to have them leapfrog and we'd see something as a one loss you know, Power Five Conference champs, something we haven't seen before. So uh, I'm laying the 10 and a half points here. I think Oklahoma State and Mike Gundy still feel like they've got a shot to represent the Big 12 in the college football playoff, Emory. Absolutely, and it's that defense, man. And when you talk about from start to finish, how well they play defensively, that's where I've been very impressed with Oklahoma State. Offensively, I don't trust them as much. The run game I do trust is Spencer Sanders at quarterback. You don't, You never really know. But if he's contributing to the run game, that's fine. Uh, but in this game, it's going to be all about defense. Can you get those early stops on uh, Texas Tech? And I think they will. That's why I just like the Cowboys to win big. And they kind of want to set up a situation where they win big this week, they win big or win close next week, and then they win big again in the Big 12 championship game. That way you kind of keep Oklahoma, you know, ranked high, or if it's a close loss to, to Oklahoma State, and you beat the brakes off of them in the Big 12 championship game. So I think there's a little bit more gamesmanship uh, in, in this last three uh, stretch of games for, for uh, Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State playoff contender because they've got some games out there against uh, highly ranked teams where they could make some hay down the stretch. Number 11, Baylor. That could be a team that ends up in the Big 12 championship game. They're at K-State. This is a pick em, Brady. It's a pick em, and, and the line's already moved a little bit, too. Uh, at one point, you actually saw uh, Baylor giving a point. It's already moved down to a pick em since it opened. So it's giving you kind of indication that, hey, maybe Manhattan's going to be a, a tough place to go to and try to find a way of getting a win. This will be the definition of a hangover game for Baylor. You've got that huge win versus Oklahoma. Your Big 12 champs or, or their opportunity for you to potentially go and play for the Big 12 championship it's not necessarily out. Now, you need Oklahoma to lose either this week or next week. Uh, and then, or, you, or you could have Oklahoma State lose two in a row, which I don't think is going to happen. So it's still out there for Baylor. The problem is this Kansas State team over the course of the last few weeks, you look at Deuce Vaughn rushing for over 100 yards, impact the rushing attack. This is one of the better defenses, too, in the Big 12. And so don't be surprised if K-State – doesn't, we can't call it an upset, but at least by ranking standards, yeah. we could call it that. And you see Baylor Emory, unfortunately, have this hangover after pulling off such a big win versus Oklahoma and all of a sudden laying an egg the following week in Kansas State. We've seen it too many times this year. I'm not getting fooled for it, Emory. I'm taking K-State in the pick'em. Well, see, that's why I like Baylor on the opposite side. This is a game where Baylor will have to play 
And when you decide to, to you know, take up football and they hand you that football guidebook, it, they basically hand you what Kansas State does. Run the ball, play good defense, play great special teams. That's the forefront of any good football team. But I do trust in Dave Aranda and what he does defensively. K-State style forces you to play a 60-minute game. I think that's the type of matchup you want coming off of a big emotional win against Oklahoma. So I like Baylor here because of how Kansas State plays. You got to stay focused for the full game, and they'll be focused out there on the field. Okay, one more ranked team in the Big 12 in action, and that's Oklahoma. Brady, you're going to be there on the sidelines for this one. Oklahoma, number 13, giving four at home to Iowa State. Now, before the season started, Iowa State was ranked seventh in the country, seventh in the preseason AP poll. They sit here at six and four out of the Big 12 championship race. They just lost to Texas Tech, and Matt Campbell had an interesting soundbite this week in Ames. Take a listen. How do you, as a coach, view goals? Because at the beginning of the season, you, your players, the goal was Big 12 championship. Oh, not me. That was never my goal. Okay. My goal has always been one thing, and that's to become the best version of ourselves we can become. So you've never heard me say that word once. Um, you've only heard me talk about becoming the best version of yourself you can be. And really, my challenge for this year's team was to become the greatest together team in the history of Iowa State football. And so far, all of our goals are still intact from a Coach Campbell standpoint. Now, could our players have other goals and aspirations? Sure. Do I want them to have great goals and aspirations? Sure. But that's not Coach Campbell's goal. That was never said by me. All right, Brady Quinn, former Heisman finalist, have at it. What? <laughs> I mean, was, that, was he serious there? I mean, look, yeah, of course winning the Big 12. Look, you were a top 10 ranked team to start the season. Yeah. You got to the Big 12 championship game. Like, the natural progression and next step you should want to make as a coach, as a team, as a university is winning your conference, which I think you pointed out they haven't done in, what, 100 years? More than. Yeah. So wouldn't you think that somewhere in Ames, Iowa, there's something that says – Winning the Big 12 is part of our goals. I mean, unless they're moving conferences and want to go somewhere else, like, like OU in Texas. I mean, the reality is I can't believe he actually said that out loud. I mean, we're not working for participation trophies. Right. I, what we're trying I'll to win championships and win football games. He's, he's, uh, he's really calculated when he talks to the media in public. And I have never heard him say publicly that that's the goal. But I don't think that's the point. I think the point is that internally that had to be a goal, right? But, but Sure. And being the best version of yourself is something that I think everyone aspires to be in sure. every way of their, their life. But like as a team, as an organization – you want to be the best at what you do. In order to do that, like you're, you're represented by that if you win your conference. And so I have no idea what the thought process is behind saying that publicly the way he did. I mean, it's one thing to say, you know, the, the way we phrase it is different. You know, we set ourselves out to have a different way of stating our goals and not, like, correcting him. Say, no, 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 that was never our intention. Like, oh, really? Like, you, at no point in time your intention wasn't to win the Big 12 but that wasn't a goal for you? I mean, it's just it, – it, it's got to be bad for recruiting – and you think about all the guys who came back. I mean, right. they have a few players that could have gotten drafted, that could have left for the NFL. They came back because they wanted to win a Big 12 championship. They wanted to have a shot at going to play for the college football playoff. When you start the season ranked the seventh, that's your goal. Like, that's what you're thinking about. You want to try to come back and win a championship, conference, or national championship. And so it's just crazy to me that you would actually say that, regardless of how the rhetoric and how you want to go about saying what your goals are. But that's, that would be how he says it. It's unbelievable. Emery, Matt Campbell says all the goals for Iowa State are still out there. The goal this week, go into Norman and beat Oklahoma. They're four-point underdogs. What do you think? L listen, man, I, I can um, only imagine that, that preseason meeting. Hey, guys, what we're trying to do here is go to the CBS Sports HQ Shrimp Fry Rice Bowl. That's it. That's how, <laughs> that's how I'm doing, right? But, like, now we understand why they lost all those games this year, man. They didn't have a goal. So their goal is just to get better every every day or every week. Like, that's just b bizarre, man. Lay those points with Oklahoma, man. It, I was going to go with Iowa State in, in preparing for this game. But after those comments, you know what, man? Oklahoma got this easily. Yeah, You know what? I, I'm, I'm right there with you. Jack, change my pick. I, I had Iowa State. and uh, Like, Brees Hall's had a lot of success. They've had success. You know, running the football, the average was like 100 yards, something like that. I, I can't sign on to this. Really? Like, how? I mean, after w witnessing that, I mean, come on. Oklahoma's playing at home. They'll figure it out. Caleb Williams will figure it out. He struggled, obviously, to take care of the football, got pressured. And I think the, the blueprint for what 
you know, Baylor does and Dave Aranda did isn't necessarily the same thing as what Iowa State's going to do. So this could be a close game. I think Oklahoma wins in the end. I'm going to go ahead and just say right now, I'm going to lay the four points. I'm, okay. I'm changing my pick. Brady's had it with Iowa State. He is, uh, he's the best version of himself here today. No, I, I, trust taken. me, I'm a work in progress, but I mean, you're, you're, it's, your whole thing is about winning championships. I'm sorry, that's why you play the games. Oklahoma is the pick for both Brady and Emery, and uh, they also agree on Oklahoma State minus the 10.5 at Texas Tech. Few more games to pick, including Ole Miss. Might be headed for a New Year's Six Bowl if they can finish things out. Can they cover the five touchdown spread against Vandy? Best of the rest from the ranked college football slate. Uh, UTSA still perfect. That's a huge game in Conference USA. Basically the battle for the division there in the Conference USA West division. Also have a Friday night game there at the bottom on CBS Sports Network. That's 11.30 Eastern time Friday night. Really, really, really late in Vegas. San Diego State with just the one loss this season. Let's start by picking Ole Miss and Vandy. 36 and a half is a lot of points in the SEC unless we're talking Vanderbilt. And that's just how bad their offense is at scoring points and their defense is at stopping anyone. In particular, one of the more prolific offenses with Matt Corral at the quarterback spot for Ole Miss, who should, by the way, get a trip to New York for the Heisman. He, he is by far and away one of the best players in this country. He's lifted up his team. Huge win last week, too, for Ole Miss. And really keeping kind of, I don't want to say their hopes alive for a playoff or anything like that, but just, you know, finishing off the season the right way. So, Emory, this one's easy for me. You lay the 36 and a half points. You don't think about it. One iota, you just move forward uh, with the next game. Absolutely. You look at this game, 45 to 3. Ole Miss rolls. That offense is just a point a minute, and Vanderbilt is punchless. So I just see this one as being a route from start to finish, not even in question about this point spread. I have a great stat from CBS Sports and the, the statisticians we have. Vanderbilt won the first 19 meetings between these two schools. Vandy has now lost 19 straight SEC games heading into this one. Let's move on to number 14, BYU. But BYU, a heavy favorite here. Heavy favorite and coming off the bye, which should really you know play to their strengths here. But look, both teams want to run the football. I think the best play here is actually the under. It's not even that, that spread with as big as it is. Uh, and that being said, I mean, Logan Wright, the running back for Georgia Southern, he'll, he'll help keep this one close. Uh, Tyler Algier is one of the better running backs, already over 1,000 yards this season for BYU. So I think BYU wins this one. I don't feel great about how big that spread is between these two teams. But to me, Emery, the under is the best play of this one. Listen, as a Sunbelt Conference expert here, mm -hmm. I, I'm going to look at this this game differently. But usually when Georgia Southern is good, it's because they have good defense. They don't have good defense this year. BYU rolls, especially up front, man. You talked about LJ running the football. That offensive line should be able to lean on that defensive front. They'll run past Georgia Southern, pun intended, and lay those points comfortably as well. Georgia Southern had a dude that uh, is a country music singer who drank a beer on top of a bus before a game earlier this season. I think it was part of the reason why the head coach got fired there. Friday night, late night football. I only know because I called the Georgia That's Southern right. game earlier. That's right. And you talked about it. And I'm sure that. Emery knows because yeah. he's Mr. Sunbelt. Uh, San Diego State, UNLV, Vegas. They've won two straight after yeah. a 14-game losing skit. Yeah, but they also have one of the best running backs in the Mountain West in Charles Williams. So he's going to be a play a factor in all of this along with Greg Bell. This is another one where I look at it and say, Take the under. It'll be a shortened game between these two teams. And we know how good that San Diego State defense is. Uh, obviously, last week, Brady Hoke showcased the fact that even with a contrast of style going up against Nevada, they can still you know, stop a prolific passing attack. So they're versatile. They make adjustments. And they're one of the better teams in college football. That is San Diego State. So I'm laying the 10.5, but I think a low-scoring game here, Emery. I'm taking Chuck Wagon and UNLV in the points here. Great nickname, by the way, because you expect someone to be nicknamed Chuck Wagon to be 6'2", 240. He's 5'9", 185 pounds. Love it. And Quiet has kept UNLV as played very good defense the last four weeks. I think their defense will be the key here. Lower scoring game. I agree with Brady there. That under looks sweet. But I think UNLV will keep this one very close to take the rubbles of the points. UNLV finally turning things around. They've got the, the new building there. They own half of it where the Raiders play. That's arrow pointing up for the Rebels. All right, big game in Conference USA as uh, Mr. Group of Five, Emery. I'm going to let you have it this one because it's a great game in Conference USA. UAB has won the conference two of the last three seasons. UTSA is unbeaten right now. Yeah, and they deserve to be because they can run the heck out of football with Sincere McCormick, outstanding tailback. Frank Harris, the quarterback, is playing much more efficient this year. 
And I'm a big fan of Tariq Woolen, the 6'4", 205-pound cornerback out there on the perimeter. He really locks things down because he's a former wide receiver, so you definitely don't want to throw his weight because he can catch the football. And I think defensively is what will be the reason why they run away with this one. They can shut down any offense. I thought their best test was against UTEP, and they really made UTEP look like they hadn't been running the football well at all all season long. So I like the Roadrunners here out of the cover. To me, the play here is the under. I like that better than the four and a half. I do think this could be a close game with the way both teams uh, can effectively move the football or run the football in that case. But if I had to lay them, I'd lay them with UTS. Sam, with you there, Emory. But I think the under is the better play between the two. Trying to find that Georgia Southern, uh, uh, Georgia Charleston Southern line. Did you ever find one on that offshore? No, on... no I did not. Yeah, if it I, was, I really didn't look that hard. If it was 60 points. I, I would lay the points. You would lay it? Yeah. Okay. Emory? Yeah, and I saw one where uh, Mississippi State is 44 points up on uh, Prairie View, uh, or Texas A&M is, so I would lay those points too. Okay, yeah, you can find those offshore lines, uh, but you're not going to find it at the Caesar Sportsbook because we keep it to FBS on FBS only. Uh, for Brady Quinn and Emery Hunt, I'm Do you want a sports network that delivers everything that matters about the game, the highlights, the picks, the instant analysis, no yelling, no fake debates, no politics? Hit the subscribe button and never miss a moment.